Good afternoon. Yesterday, Commissioner Lucky announced her retirement as Commissioner of the RCMP. I would like to begin by expressing my gratitude to Commissioner Lucky for her nearly four decades of service in protecting Canadians. Uh, she served in a number of different capacities from protecting communities across five provinces to serving abroad in peacekeeping missions to eventually leading Depot, which is where the RCMP recruit uh, new members to the force. Um, the Commissioner has shown tireless efforts in doing everything that she possibly can to protect Canadians. I also want to say that um, she served as the first woman Commissioner of the RCMP, and in doing so, um, she inspired future generations of young women to see themselves better reflected in this institution. On a personal note, I want to express my uh, gratitude to Commissioner Lucky for her partnership, as I've said on a number of different occasions, on the easiest of days, serving as Commissioner of the RCMP is a challenging job. We will now begin the process of recruiting the next Commissioner of the RCMP, one that I am very much looking forward to, as is the government, and we will search out somebody uh, who re reflects the best values and capabilities and skills and who is committed to continuing to reform this institution and maintain the confidence of all Canadians. And what did Pardon, je vais uh, compléter une déclaration maintenant très, très rapidement en français. Hier, la commissaire uh, de la GRC, Brenda Lucky, a annoncé qu'elle uh, doit prendre sa retraite. Je veux commencer avec une expression de mon gratitude uh, pour d'avoir consacré sa carrière à la protection de tous les Canadiens et Canadiennes. Uh, elle a... Uh, travaille dans plusieurs des capacités pour protéger les communautés dans cinq provinces. Elle a travaillé hors de Canada pour garder le, le pays. Et finalement, elle était le chef de le dépôt où le GRC recrutait des nouveaux membres. Plus important que ça, elle était euh, le premier commissaire femme. Et cet exemple va, j'espère, inspirer des jeunes femmes qui maintenant euh, vont euh, être mieux reflétés dans cette institution. Euh, dans un, un autre personnel, je veux exprimer mon gratitude. Euh, dans les plus simples jours, euh, plus faciles jours, le job de commissaire de la GRC est vraiment difficile. Personnellement, euh, je veux remercier la commissaire pour son partenariat et maintenant le gouvernement va commencer le processus de euh, trouver un nouveau chef de la, la GRC. On va trouver une personne qui a toutes les qualifications, toutes les valeurs pour continuer un processus de réformation pour cette institution. Merci. Est-ce que vous avez obtenu une copie du rapport de la commission Rouleau? Non. Quand vous attendez-vous à recevoir? Euh, nous sommes en train, euh, comme tout le monde, euh, d'attendre pour euh, euh, une, une copie de, de la rapport, mais euh, la plus importante chose est que le gouvernement a participé dans le processus de l'enquête publique on a euh, montré notre cas euh, pour les raisons qu'on avait pris la décision. C'est une décision dans le, la vie de le gouvernement qui était nécessaire, euh, mais euh, nous sommes euh, très anxieux de recevoir le, le rapport de le juge Rouleau et, pris, et puis prendre les leçons, euh, implémenter les leçons pour mieux protéger nos, euh, nos, nos communautés. Est-ce qu'il faut établir un lien entre le départ de Mme Loki et le dépôt prochain du rapport? Non. No. But, sir, some people are obviously going to think that fact that she's announced her resignation just days before we expect a report to become public. But those two things are related, given that there were questions raised by members of the government about uh, what she did and didn't say and had to happen. I want to underscore that Commissioner Lucky's decision was a personal one, and one that I respect and that the government respects. As I said in my remarks, um, serving in the capacity of Commissioner of the RCMP, RCMP on the easiest days is a very difficult one. And clearly there, there have been many challenges. I also want to commend and acknowledge that the Commissioner has been able to make some progress in a number of different reforms, but there's still a lot of work to be done uh, with regards to the RCMP, which is why we want to thank her. And we will quickly begin the process of searching for a new RCMP Commissioner who will reflect all the qualifications, the skills, the experience, and the values to make those reforms and realize those reforms so that we can maintain the confidence of all Canadians in this institution. Election committee struck again to choose a new commissioner. 
Uh, we're very anxious to begin the process of recruiting the next RCMP commissioner, and that is uh, a number of uh, uh, details will be provided to that to that particular exercise as soon as we can. So, will the commissioner be in place by March 17th, or will there be an interim? Uh, I can assure all Canadians that as the Commissioner uh, transitions to her retirement that we will have a plan in place, there will be a process that will be very transparent and that will be focused on recruiting the best possible candidate to lead this world-renowned institution which works day in and day out to protect Canadians in a way that is consistent uh, with the values of Canadians and that will ensure that there's a lot of confidence in this institution. Yeah, and what is the timeline of your government to appoint the new commission? Uh, those details will become uh, public as soon as we can provide them, but rest assured that we will have a plan in place. Mon témoignage avait été très très critiqué pendant la commission Rouleau. Vous pensez pas qu'il y a un peu de ça qu'elle traînait avec elle, son héritage, Madame Madame Lucky, pour les gens qui font un lien entre les deux, parce qu'il est assez évident. Écoute, moi et mes collègues euh, offrirent tous nos témoignages avant le juge Rouleau et maintenant euh, nous, nous sommes euh, très anxieux de recevoir le, le, le rapport final. C'est un exercice, c'est un, ex un exercice de transparence, c'est une partie de l'invocation de la loi de mesure d'urgence et on va prendre toutes les leçons que le juge Rouleau va nous importer pour... Euh, pour augmenter euh, le, le niveau de confiance entre euh, les gens et, le, et nos institutions. On attend aussi la sortie du rapport McDonald's. Là, euh, donc vous ne trouvez pas que ça fait un peu beaucoup de coïncidence de non. faire la retraite avant la sortie de ces deux rapports-là? Non. Est-ce que vous aviez encore confiance en Mme Lucky? Écoute, euh, j'avais exprimé toutes mes gratitudes pour euh, le job qu'elle qu avait, qu avait fait. Gratitude, confiance, pas la même chose. Gr euh, gratitude, parce que c'est un job avec beaucoup de défis. Euh, et je veux remercier encore euh, le commissaire pour euh, son partenariat. Oui, il y a des défis. Elle avait fait euh, des progrès. Et, on, et maintenant, on va continuer de faire les réformations qui tout le monde comprend est nécessaire pour augmenter le, le confiance entre les Canadiens et les Canadiennes à la GRC. Uh, someone who will possess the experience, the skills, the qualifications, um, the values that are very much in alignment with the government, the mandate which is set out. There is a, a robust set of priorities uh, that are there uh, when it comes to a wide range of priorities. But the key thing will be to make sure that we attract the very best and brightest person who is uh, going to be able to meet the RCMP where they are at and take it to even newer heights. And that is something that I am confident that we will be able to do. Thank you very much. Merci. Bonjour tout le monde. In Canada, all you should need in order to get your health care is your health card, not your credit card. And Canadians are rightly proud of our publicly funded universal health care system, which has always been based on need, not one's ability or willingness to pay. We're committed to improving health care services and outcomes right across this country, and that's why last week's announcement of $198.6 billion over the next decade, including $48 billion in new funding, will do. We've always been here to defend and protect Canadians' equitable and universal access to health care. Our government continues to enforce the Canada Health Act, combat patient charges, and work with the provinces and territories to ensure that Canadians have access to the health care services that they need and deserve. When Canadians are charged for medically necessary services, we take action and levy deductions against provinces and territories through the Canada Health Transfer, and we'll continue to collaborate with provinces and territories to make sure that our investments are used in the best interests of healthcare workers and patients. That's in a way that respects the Canada Health Act. We cannot vote in favour of a motion that expresses disappointment in the Prime Minister, who's working hard with ministers and premiers right across this country to improve health outcomes and the health care system at large. This funding will improve services, it'll reduce wait times, it'll increase the number of doctors, nurses, nurse practitioners in the health care system, and it'll make life better for Canadians. While we will not be supporting this, note, this motion, I can assure Canadians that we'll continue to stay focused on what matters to them, protecting their universal health care system, making sure there's more doctors, nurses and nurse practitioners in the system, and ensuring that patients across this country aren't subject to long wait times and not enough family doctors, and we don't want any Canadians to have to pay out of pocket for their health care. Thank you very much. Why not just, you know, if you believe in the principle of the what kind of president would he create?
Well, very clearly, I, uh, personally, I'm proud of the work that the Minister of Health and the Prime Minister have been doing over the last couple of weeks to find common ground with premiers across the country from every province and territory. And, you know, you don't have to uh, look too far with the, the national level organizations who have expressed confidence in the, uh, in the agreements and in, in this plan. Um, we have confidence in the way forward, and I, I believe that this, uh, this motion is a bit of a distraction. I'm always here to stand against privatized health care, to stand up for equitable delivery of health care, to ensure uh, that money is, is, is spent um, to support health care workers and to improve patient outcomes. Um, but I don't believe that this motion will achieve any of those things. But at the same time, there are some worries in Ontario, for example, that maybe Mr. Ford will go that way. Uh, don't you feel that this, it's sim all symbolic, but that it kind of leaves the door open to, to that kind of uh, decision? I am also concerned about over-privatization of health care, and that's why I'm here to stand up for universal access, for public delivery, and for equitable uh, delivery of health care services right across this country. Um, we are working right now, as we speak, with provinces and territories to ensure that those, uh, those outcomes are improved. Canadians deserve and need that health care. You know, think about my mom. She's, uh, she's waiting on cataracts and a new knee. And I'm focused on making sure that the wait times are reduced and there's enough doctors and nurses in the system so that moms like mine can get the services that they need in, uh, in an expedient manner. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad to be here at the mic just for a moment or two to, with my colleagues, of course, Mike Morris, Member of Parliament for Kitchener Centre, and Jonathan Pedneau, Deputy Leader of the Green Party of Canada. I just wanted to, uh, actually we're obviously today in a new Democratic Party Opposition Day motion on public health care in Canada. Uh, we support the motion being debated today. We wanted to raise another issue that was importantly in a report card released earlier this week on child poverty in Canada. Um, this report card from the uh, Campaign 2000, of course, it's called Campaign 2000 because the Parliament of Canada pledged in the 1990s that by the year 2000 we would end child poverty in Canada. And the single biggest reduction in child poverty that we've ever had in Canada occurred uh, in the year in which CERB payments were received by Canadian families. Thanks to CERB, child poverty dropped by 40%. And tragically, even with a drop of 40%, that still one in eight children lived in poverty in this country. So we joined Campaign 2000 in calling for an amnesty on any effort to reclaim CERB payments from Canadian families living below the poverty line, from Canadian individuals living below the poverty line. This is a waste of government resources to chase down the poor for CERB repayments. We know that there were COVID um, supports received by multinationals and very successful corporations that paid their shareholders dividends and paid themselves bonuses. Fine, go after those corporations to get back uh, payments for COVID support for salary reimbursement, but stop any effort to go after poor families who received their payments. But turn briefly to Jonathan Pedneau for a few words en français aussi, merci. Euh, je vais m'adresser en français euh, sur une question qui est importante pour moi. Je suis un petit gars de la rive sud de Montréal. J'ai grandi avec une mère monoparentale. Ce bulletin qui traite de la pauvreté euh, chez les enfants partout dans le pays nous indique clairement qu'avec la PCU, on a eu une baisse significative de la pauvreté euh, chez les enfants puis dans les familles, notamment les familles monoparentales. On apprend aussi dans ce rapport qu'il faut un minimum, pour une mère monoparentale, il faut un minimum dans cette économie de 33 900 dollars par année après impôts euh, pour survenir aux besoins euh, du ménage. Ça, c'est 45 000 avant impôts. Et malheureusement, on a des efforts, on voit des efforts présentement de la part du gouvernement euh, d'aller rechercher de l'argent de la PCU qui a été, euh, été peut-être pas super bien distribué, euh, mais qui, euh, à travers ces efforts-là, est en train de faire perdre du temps, des ressources nécessaires au gouvernement pour aller à la recherche de ces fonds-là qui sont, au final, et qui ont bénéficié à faire réduire la pauvreté infantile partout à travers le pays. Euh, ces efforts de, pour aller chercher ces fonds-là devraient se concentrer plutôt sur les corporations, les entreprises qui ont bénéficié euh, et parfois abusé de ces paiements euh, tout au long de la pandémie. Euh, nous, on dit que c'est important que le gouvernement prenne soin des familles, des familles monoparentales. On voit bien, à travers ce rapport-là, que des mouvements comme
Infocom, le revenu, basique, le revenu de base garanti euh, pourrait aider les familles à faire face à l'inflation présente. Malheureusement, la vérificatrice générale, je ne sais pas si tu veux en parler, la vérificatrice générale nous a dit dans un récent rapport que euh, la PCU a contribué à garder des gens à l'extérieur du marché du travail. Soyons clairs, avec la PCU, on avait 2 000 par mois, c'est 24 000 par année. Rappelons-le, pour une mère monoparentale dans cette économie d'aujourd'hui, ça prendrait un minimum de 45 000 avant impôt pour subvenir aux besoins de la famille. Donc, c'est très certainement pas la PCU qui garde les gens à l'extérieur euh, du marché du travail. Ce sont des salaires plutôt euh, trop bas euh, dans une économie avec des taux d'inflation trop élevés qui gardent les gens euh, à l'extérieur du marché du travail. Oui, merci. De, um encore une fois, merci. Et merci à mon collègue. J'ai oublié de mentionner que dans le rapport de vérificatrice générale, il y a une allégation que je pense n'est pas vraie. So, yes, we also were very concerned that in the Auditor General report on CERB repayments, the Auditor General stated, as though it were a fact, that the CERB payments had represented a disincentive to return to work. Uh, I did pursue this with the Auditor General and ask for an explanation, and it was really a tautology. They made the, the assumption in the Auditor General's office without the kind of detailed evidence that we find in this report on child poverty, the Auditor General's office made the assumption that people didn't want to go back to work if they were serving, receiving CERB, and at $2,000 a month, if that was more than they were earning before, then they would not be returning to work. We do believe that there must be a completion of our social safety net and a guaranteed livable income to ensure that no Ch Canadian child, that no Canadian in, in the disabled community, lives below the poverty line. So as, as we know, I'd, I'd call Mike up now, but I want to, to talk about the disability benefit. But we'll take a few questions and see if there's still time. Moi, j'avais une question à vous poser concernant la uh, loi C-13 sur uh, uh, la réforme, évidemment, de la loi sur les langues officielles. Ouais. Quelle est la position du Parti vert là nous sommes en faveur de la langue, le projet de loi C13. C'est tellement important de défendre la langue française ici au Canada. Et peut-être Jonathan peut ajouter quelques mots. J'aimerais savoir si la loi C13, telle qu'elle est rédigée ou déposée par les libéraux, ou telle qu'elle est projetée d'être amendée par les partis d'opposition pour faire en sorte que la charte québécoise de la langue française s'applique au Québec. Avec la loi C-13, ce qu'on est en train de voir, c'est un caucus libéral qui est divisé avec des députés libéraux qui euh, se jettent euh, de la boue au visage les uns les autres. Puis ça, pour moi, c'est surprenant de voir ça parce qu'on a un caucus libéral qui, autrement, est assez discipliné. On l'a vu, on a, on a un ministre de l'Environnement, ex-environnementaliste, euh, qui a été forcé euh, d'aller approuver B du Nord. Donc, je ne comprends pas comment ça se fait qu'on a autant de divisions au sein du caucus libéral si, véritablement, euh, c'était euh, l'objectif de défendre la, la langue française. Puis c'est un objectif qu'on partage au Parti vert. Personnellement, je suis totalement en faveur de l'application de la Charte de la, loi, de la langue française euh, à l'intérieur du BC-13 pour les entreprises fédérales au Québec. Euh, je pense que c'est quelque chose que nos membres au Parti vert au Québec désirent. Euh, maintenant, euh, nos députés, comme vous le savez, ne sont pas « whipped », donc on n'oblige pas le vote euh, d'une manière ou d'une autre. C'est un vote qui se fait sur la base euh, de, des messages, de, du feedback qu'on reçoit des, euh, des électeurs sur le terrain. Euh, donc, Mike et Elisabeth voteront bien évidemment euh, comme ils le désirent, mais personnellement, je suis absolument en faveur de cette loi-là. Je trouve ça surprenant euh, que du côté des libéraux, on ait autant de divisions présentement. Pendant, pendant que vous êtes là tous les deux, euh, est-ce que vous allez voter pour? Parce que peut-être que ce sera serré en vote en troisième lecture. Ouais. <rire> Pour, pour moi, c'est un processus qui a, a besoin de dérouler encore. Alors, pour mon vote moi-même, je veux parler avec euh, la chef de la partie verte et mon communauté à Kitchener. Et on peut par parler encore quand nous, quand nous sommes encore à la troisième euh, étage. Est-ce qu'il y a des autres questions? Mais sur les faits minimales, dans les cas d'agression sexuelle, le Bloc québécois voudrait déposer un projet là pour corriger ces euh, Qu'est-ce que vous pensez de ça? C'est une bonne idée, le retour des familles. 
Non, je suis absolument contre les pénalités minimums. Je pense que ce n'est contre le les, les pr principe de progressif euh, mesure pour euh, réduire les crimes. C est, c est, ce plus, il, il y a un bilan affreux et je suis contre euh, chaque mesure ou de euh, pénalité minimum. Même pour, dans les cas d'agression sexuelle, on a Absolument. Des, des gens condamnés à Montréal qui qui des peines à domicile pour des agressions sexuelles graves. Oui, c'est une question pour chaque juge dans chaque cas. Et, et je pense que c'est les, 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 euh, un peu satisfié de dire, oh, nous, nous avons les peines des minimums. Mais en, en réalité, ils ne marchent pas. Est-ce qu'il y a des autres questions? Merci, Merci beaucoup. Merci. 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 Bonjour. Oui. Alors, je suis heureux de vous dire aujourd'hui qu'au Bloc québécois, on entend déposer prochainement, au cours des prochaines semaines, un projet de loi pour essayer de régler les différentes problématiques qui sont majeures et qui préoccupent l'ensemble des citoyens du Québec. Et j'ai parlé de la question des crimes comiques des armes à feu et des agressions sexuelles. On a vu que cette semaine, l'Assemblée nationale, en fait, c'est hier, a adopté une motion unanime à l'effet de dire, ben C5 nous nuit dans la lutte contre les crimes d'agression sexuelle. On demande au fédéral de corriger le tir. Alors, euh, moi, j'ai l'intention de le faire. On va être proactif au Bloc québécois. Là, on critique quand c'est le temps de critiquer. Là, je pense qu'il est temps de, de, faire, de proposer quelque chose. Et j'y vais avec une mouture un peu semblable à ce que j'avais proposé en amendement à C5, pour ceux qui ont suivi à l'époque des travaux sur C5, et je disais, bien écoutez, il y a des gens qui veulent les peines minimales, d'autres qui ne veulent pas. Moi, je disais, bien, la, la position qui m'apparaîtrait raisonnable, c'est de dire, on va les maintenir, les peines minimales, pour les crimes de, avec euh, armes à feu, mais on permettrait aux tribunaux d'y déroger dans des circonstances exceptionnelles. Alors, je pense qu'on peut appliquer le même raisonnement pour les agressions sexuelles, pour lesquelles il n'y avait pas de possibilité de sursis entre 2007 et 2015, de, et deux, pardon, et, deux, et de, l'an dernier, 2022. Et là, avec l'arrivée de C5, on réintroduit la possibilité de donner des peines avec sursis sur les, sur les agressions sexuelles. Alors, là aussi, on pourrait revenir à l'ancienne mouture, interdire les peines avec sursis, et, et, et permettre les peines minimales sur les crimes avec des armes à feu et, dans les deux cas, permettre aux tribunaux d'y déroger lorsque c'est exceptionnellement injuste de l'appliquer. On, on oui. dit que vous ne pouvez pas déposer un projet de loi sur un sujet qui a déjà été voté par la Chambre. Ah ben, il n'est pas question de revenir sur ces cinq. J'en parle de ces cinq pour expliquer un peu le raisonnement, mais nous, ce qu'on va proposer, c'est un projet de loi qui s'adresse au code criminel actuel en vigueur, c'est-à-dire qu'on croit que les peines... Si on ne pouvait pas revenir sur la question de l'obligation ou pas des peines minimales avec, euh, euh, sur les crimes avec armes à feu, ça voudrait dire que ces cinq n'auraient pas été euh, possibles puisqu'il y avait déjà eu une législation qui avait proposé les peines minimales. Vous vous souviendrez? Que... Ça, dans un même Parlement, en tout cas, il faut voir, mais… mais... Bien, écoutez, il va, moi, je on n'en a pas proposé, mais on va y revenir. Ça, c'est ce que j'appellerais la cuisine. Là, on va voir, je vais voir ça avec l'équipe de recherche. On a, on, a, on a été saisis hier de la position de l'Assemblée nationale. Ça nous a choqué de voir que cette problématique-là. Alors, on, on croit dans la vertu de la proposition qui avait été faite d'aménager une possibilité pour le tribunal d'y déroger tant aux peines minimales que sur les agressions sexuelles. On va revenir avec ça. Et bon, j'ai bon espoir qu'on soit en mesure de trouver une voie de passage qui soit acceptable sur le plan législatif et qui satisfasse aux préoccupations qui ne sont pas banales là, de la population québécoise. Et j'en suis certain que c'est pareil pour l'ensemble du reste du Canada. Monsieur Lamétier oui, a l'air à tenir à sa réforme parce qu'il dit que ça ouais. visait euh, donc des objectifs bien précis et que c'est au juge, au final, de l'interpréter, sa loi. Vous répondez quoi? Ouais. Bien, moi, je réponds que les gens ont besoin d'être assurés. Le, le signal qu'on envoie, quand un individu se présente devant un tribunal, par exemple, pour un crime commis avec arme à feu, et qu'auparavant, qu disons, il y a deux ans, il y aurait eu une peine minimale applicable, et que là, il n'y en a pas, bien, il dit au juge, monsieur le juge, écoutez, là, la, le crime dont on m'accuse est moins grave aujourd'hui qu'il ne l'était il y a deux, trois ans. Le législateur l'a dit, c'est tellement moins grave qu'on abolit l'obligation de peine de prison. Alors, et, et on a le même phénomène avec les demandes de libération conditionnelle. Au comité juridique, on étudie présentement la question de la loi sur les libérations conditionnelles. Et je posais la question, pas plus tard qu'hier, à, à des témoins. Qu'est-ce que vous en pensez? Bien oui, l'avocat qui se présente...
présente devant un juge sur une demande de libération conditionnelle, c'est bien évident qu'il va plaider cet argument-là, M. le juge. Écoutez, le crime dont on accuse mon client n'est même plus passible d'une peine minimale obligatoire, donner un break sa libération conditionnelle, même s'il est condamné, il ne fera peut-être pas de prison. Tu sais. Alors, je ne dis pas que ce n'est pas correct, là. on pense que c'est correct de donner une marge de manœuvre au juge, mais on pense aussi que la population a besoin d'être rassurée avec des critères clairs, et il m'apparaît que les crimes, pas tout, là, mais les crimes commis avec une arme à feu, je pense à celui qui, qui, dont l'image me revient sans cesse, là, une infraction de, de décharger une arme à feu avec l'intention de le faire. Écoute, là, à un moment donné, là, tu, tu prends un fusil, tu sais sur quelqu'un, il faut qu'il y ait des conséquences sérieuses à ça. Alors, nous, on pense qu'effectivement, la peine minimale, dans des cas comme ça, est, 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 devrait être appliquée, toujours en permettant au tribunal, dans des cas exceptionnels, d'y déroger. Oui, tout à fait. C'est la raison pour laquelle je dis qu'il faut introduire cette possibilité-là de donner au juge l'occasion de déroger aux peines minimales. Je pense toujours à l'exemple du jeune homme euh, dans le bas du fleuve au Québec là, qui avait été accusé d'agression sexuelle. Euh, je ne me souviens plus précisément des faits, là, mais il y avait, je crois, à l'époque, peut-être 18 ans, sa blonde 16 ou 17 ans, puis le juge a dit « ben là, j'ai comme pas le choix, là, il y a, concrètement, objectivement, il y a une infraction de commise et il y a une peine minimale de prison à, à imposer. » Et ça, ça faisait, ça choquait à peu près tout le monde. Mais, quoi, mais quoi, nous, ce qu'on dit, c'est que dans un cas comme ça, le juge aurait pu y déroger à la peine minimale parce qu'on introduit la possibilité pour le tribunal de ne pas appliquer la peine minimale dans des circonstances exceptionnelles. Il y a une différence d'application parce que le principe actuellement, c'est pas de peine minimale. Nous, on dit le principe, c'est peine minimale, X années, X mois de prison, mais on peut y déroger dans les circonstances exceptionnelles. C'est pas prématuré, parce que, je veux dire, il y a quand même, je pense, sauf erreur, là, un cas qui a été plus médiatisé, etc. Je veux dire, est-ce que c'est pas un peu euh, prématuré de, de proposer ça maintenant, alors qu'il y a un cas d'application, il va y en avoir d'autres, puis la Cour va interpréter ça, non? Ou... On, on peut être prématuré ou être en retard ou être au bon moment, puis on va le savoir seulement dans cinq ans ou dans dix ans, est-ce qu'on a été trop vite ou trop lent. Moi, je pense qu'on a un problème, là. On l'identifie. Si on n'est pas d'accord, ça, c'est autre chose. On peut argumenter, discuter, trouver d'autres voies, de, 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 aménager d'autres euh, façons de faire. Mais si on est d'accord pour dire que ce serait une bonne idée, bien, n'attendons pas qu'il y ait deux, trois, quatre, cinq, six accusations, procès, peut-être des gens qui se font assassiner, blessés ou euh, agressés sexuellement ou peu importe. Je pense qu'on doit... Notre job comme législateur, c'est de prévoir les coûts puis essayer d'aménager un système juridique qui soit efficace pour protéger la population. Mais on est, encore une fois, on a voté, vous vous souviendrez, en faveur de la déjudiciarisation. Pour nous, c'est important, la, ré, la réhabilitation et tout ça. On ne revient pas sur ces principes-là. On dit juste qu'il y a des catégories de crimes qui méritent un traitement peut-être plus sérieux que celui qu'on lui accorde présentement. Merci. 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 Hi, I'm Randall Garrison, the NDP's justice critic, and uh, I'm here to answer any questions you might have on C40. I have questions on C5. Uh, okay. Which is justice too. Yeah. But um, what do you think of the Bloc Québécois who wants to introduce a bill to um, to reintroduce a minimum sentencing for sexual assault and also firearms? So these matters were fully debated in this parliament uh, and a decision was made to eliminate those mandatory minimums and uh, reintroducing a bill in this parliament is technically not possible. Why is that? Why is that? Because it's an already decided matter and the speaker would be certain to rule it out of order. We've already voted on that in this parliament. But if it's a new bill? No, nope, can't, can't do a new bill on the same topic. Okay. But, so you're against minimal sentencing? But we have cases in Montreal where people who committed um, a serious sexual assault are um, uh, having their sentence uh, done at home, and, which is very controversial right now. So Well, I, I guess I'd say eliminating mandatory minimums restores discretion to judges to come up with an appropriate sentence that both uh, serves to punish offenders and keep the public safe. And I don't know the details of individual cases, but I trust judges. Uh, eliminating mandatory minimums doesn't mean reducing sentences. It means increasing the discretion to make sure the sentence is appropriate and that it contributes to public safety. Okay. On C40, you, I guess you, will, you guys will be... Uh 
supporting the government on this? So we're happy to see them bringing forward legislation because too often our system has failed Indigenous and racialized Canadians resulting in wrongful convictions uh, and imprisonment for uh, offences which weren't committed by those people or for which they didn't have proper legal representation. So we're glad to see that legislation move forward, uh, but we're going to be looking very closely to make sure the Commission has the powers it needs to respond to the demands of the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women's Inquiry and the Truth and Reconciliation Commission to reduce the over-incarceration of Indigenous people and in, in particular Indigenous women. How fast do you think, if it goes through, how fast do you think? Well, obviously setting, setting up a new commission will take some time and we understand that, uh, but we're hoping this legislation will move quickly through Parliament. But again, we want to make sure that when we do this, we do it so that the Commission can actually solve the problems that are on the table and uh, not just serve the interests of a narrow group of people who have, yes, been wrongly convicted, but attack those systemic problems that result in wrongful convictions of way too many Indigenous people and in particular Indigenous women. Languages. Is your uh, caucus united when it will come to vote on Bill C-13 when amended? So in Quebec, it will be the charter of the French language of the Quebec government. Uh, Bill 96, in effect, in the province of Quebec. Is it one that you Well, I, I'm very proud of the leadership that Nikki Ash has been providing as our critic on this. And I have no doubt that when it comes time to vote that we will be a united caucus, as always. Um, the ethics commissioner is saying he feels frustrated by the Liberals, that they don't seem to really understand the Ethics Act, there have been multiple breaches, and he feels that that's really undermined the government as well as his efforts. Do you think that the consequences are strong enough for breaking under the Act or the Code? Do you think it's about more you know, information about what the two are? Well, I think it's eventually about electing a government that will respect the Ethics Code, and that would be a new Democratic Party government. Do you think, though, that MPs in general know enough about it? Would you support giving... There's, been no, lack of tr there's been no lack of training for MPs, and no lack of opportunities for those who felt they didn't understand the act to get more training, and so I don't think those are any excuses for the violations that we've seen from the Liberal ministers. But again, the solution is to elect a government that takes it very seriously and will observe the Ethics Act. Thank you. Thank you. The Prime no. Minister of Canada has announced that the Navy is going to Haiti as Parliamentary Secretary with your boss overseas. Can you tell me, what are we looking at? Are we looking at a couple frigates? Are we looking at one of the new uh, slush breakers going down? Do you have any idea what's going on? I, I'm still learning this myself, so we're, we're obviously uh, going to try to support Haiti as best we can. This is a <clears throat> horrible situation that they're dealing with, and uh, uh, anything that we can do to help, uh, we're going to try to do. What I'm trying to get at is I haven't heard anything from National Defense Headquarters, you're the Carl Sec. I, I'm trying to flush this out as to yeah. what's going on. So I'm just looking for guidance here. Yeah, and at, how will we get that? At this point, we don't have any comments. And as soon as there's something to announce, we'll announce it. Um, but like I said, there's, um, there's a lot that needs to be done. Uh, I think Canada has a role to play in helping Haiti, as, as we have in, had in the past. Um, but uh, yeah, as soon as there's an announcement uh, to, to talk about, I'm more than happy to talk to you about it. All right. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Two issues for you. First, uh, the Prime Minister says they're sending uh, two coastal defense vessels to Haiti to uh, be part of a security and surveillance force. What do you think about that? Anything? Well, clearly the Canadian forces it for a can't lot of uh, send a bigger mission than that, as General Wayne Eyre said last week. Uh, the forces don't have the capacity to send a, a greater contingent of support to Haiti. I think it's evidence of a government that has neglected to ensure that our armed forces have the equipment they need to defend the security and sovereignty of this country, but also to defend Canadian interests and values abroad. Separate subject, there are, I believe, just over 200 political asylum seekers from Nicaragua who are sitting in Washington, D.C. They want to come to Canada. Should Canada uh, let these folks in? Uh, they, they aren't fans of Mr. Ortega. I believe Mr. Ortega doesn't like them very much. So uh, well, what think, do you think? I think the Prime Minister needs to uh, work with President Biden to ensure the integrity of North America's borders. President Biden made it a priority at the uh, recent Three Amigos Summit several weeks ago to make the, the southern U.S. border a priority in their discussions. President Biden will be coming to Canada in several weeks. Uh, the Prime Minister should make it a priority to discuss our border with the United States, particularly the irregular crossing at Roxham Road. Uh, and so 
uh, that's really something that we're looking to uh, ensure the Prime Minister does. Thank you. Great. Thank you for stopping. There are a whole bunch of Nicaraguans who have escaped Nicaragua. They're sitting in Washington, D.C. They want to come to Canada. Just wondering, do you think they should be allowed asylum? They're Ortega... Uh, the dictator, you mean? Yeah, well... The yeah. dictator Ortega. You yeah. Start with that. The Sandinista leader of you know, Mr. Ortega. These people have escaped his government. They want to come to Canada. Do you think they uh, they should be allowed? Yes, to I've heard of it. I, I don't know who these people are, but I know that people who are fleeing uh, the dictator Ortega's regime deserve protection. Is the important thing is to figure out who are these people? Do they have a reasonable <coughs> claim? Have they filed for refugee status in the United States? They're obviously in a safe country right now, which is the United States of America. Uh, and there's a very large Nicaraguan community there already. Thank you. Thank you for stopping. Premier Ford has sent a letter to, Premier to the Prime Minister asking for reviews of the health care funding in five years from now uh, to, and, and also review of the bilateral agreements five years from now in the hopes of you know, keeping the system going and stuff. What do you think? Is that a good thing as health critic? Uh, you know, I think one of the things we make clear is uh, obviously our ideas are very different from the Liberal government who after eight years we see five million Canadians waiting for primary care access. We see 1.2 million Canadians waiting for procedures. We would do things very differently and uh, I think the best solution, I think I've said this before, elect a Conservative government. Thank you. Former Ethics Commissioner is saying that the government isn't taking the ethics rules as seriously as they should be. Um, do you think that that is the case? Well, I think it's all of our responsibility to work closely, closely with the Ethics Commissioner. It's a he really useful tool, actually. Um, I use the Ethics Commissioner on a regular basis, even when I'm doing my Member of Parliament uh, duties, to make sure that what I'm doing as a Member of Parliament doesn't in any way unintentionally violate the Ethics Act. In fact, all of us have uh, someone that's appointed to us from the Ethics Commission's office, and my Member of Parliament constituency staff use that person regularly as we uh, do our work at advocating for our constituents. And do you think the rules need to be stronger? Uh, listen, that's a debate that certainly I think needs to be had. Obviously we need to make sure that Canadians have trust in our system, that they have trust in the political process, and they have trust in politicians. So um, I say that, I, I would say that the, the act is important and that confidence that Canadians have in our political system is critical. Well, Thank Minister, you. Are you concerned about uh, Northern Ontario representation with the uh, new riding boundaries uh, coming down the pipe with uh, Northern Ontario set to lose one riding? Yeah, listen, that's a great question. Um, I will just say as a member of Thunder Bay Superior North, I'm pleased with the, uh, the way that the Commission has proposed the boundary uh, redistribution for my own particular riding. It pulls all of the Matawa First Nations together uh, to be represented by one Member of Parliament. So from the perspective of adequate and uh, I would say better a more effective representation that works really well for my own particular riding but in the question of losing a seat for Northern Ontario I think any loss of a seat for a region like Northern Ontario is is a setback actually um, we see with declining population uh, declining seats and that we lose our momentum when we lose our voice and I will say even across the party lines we work really efficiently as Northern members of Parliament to advocate for a region that is actually a critical region for many of the uh, agenda items of of the government and for Canadians. This is uh, uh, the Ring of Fire area, there's a ton of industry in that area and of course many Indigenous people that live in Northern Ontario. So um, obviously any loss of representation is, is concerning but in general for my own writing I think um, bringing people together from the same Tribal Council will be very effective. But Dr. Spaslowski, is his writing is the one that's disappearing? Am I correct in that? No, I think it's actually the Algoma Manitoulin writing oh, okay, that's right, disappearing. Right. Yeah. Carol Hughes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Distribution. We understand Algoma Manitoulin is disappearing. Is that true? Or are you losing your writing? Or is that is that just bad rumor by somebody here? Well, obviously, everybody's seen the report from the commission and uh, very disappointed that we would be losing a seat in Northern Ontario. Um, you know, we are going to do what we can to oppose and uh, bring some reasoning back. It's not like Northern Ontario has not. Uh, been growing. We have been growing. We just will never be able to grow at the same rate as uh, Southern Ontario. And so uh, for us, uh, you know, we, we will continue to fight to ensure that we have uh, e uh, fair representation for Northern Ontario. We don't have the transportation uh, that they have in the South. We don't have access to reliable and affordable internet. And we don't have access to a lot of the services that they have as well. 
uh, Jean Yip in Scarborough Agent Court was able to fight back and to stop her riding from disappearing. And now Don Valley East, another liberal riding, is disappearing. So, have you are you taking any pointers from her on how to how to st how to get things to go back your way, or are you just going to run against? Mark Saray and Nickel Belt or something next time? Well, first of all, I mean, this is not my first kick at the can. <laughs> and so, you know, we've been down this road before. So I don't know what the commission will decide at the end of the day and, and what other MPs may bring to the table. I think that it's important to ensure that Northern Ontario has that fair representation and we will continue to do what we can. So I'm not looking at uh, the next election. I'm looking more at what we can do to maintain the representation in Northern Ontario. And I know that the Chamber of Commerce and Capus Casing has already reached out to me. Uh, the mayor of uh, Northeast Manitoulin has reached out to me, and others are, uh, you know, coming to terms with what is being proposed, and uh, it's unacceptable for the North to lose a seat. Great, thanks. We'll share that with Senator. Bye. Am I correct in that you're trying to win Aylmer by supporting the Gatineau LRT? Like, is the Bloc trying to take Aylmer, or what? <laughs> No, but well, the block is talking for Quebec, so I think the important files for Quebec that are not, uh, I would say, getting uh, results fast enough, we have to push for them, and that's why we're pushing for, for uh, the um, tramway. Okay. It's a very important file for me, and I think that uh, Mr. Uh, Dominique Leblanc should wake up because the file is waiting on his uh, desk for uh, too long. Est-ce que c'est un tranche pour un bloquiste qui, qui supporte les, les gens d'Elmer sur un LRT, sur un tram? Est-ce est que c'est une nouveau, nouveau chose? Ou? Oh, excuse-moi. Uh, c'est le même de, de poser en, en anglais. Est-ce okay. que c'est un tranche pour, uh, pour un bloquiste? qui supportait les, les gens de Elmer sur un LRT, mais il y a beaucoup d'anglophones, c'est une fédéraliste section. Oui, que vous... Ben, vous avez raison, je veux dire, la, 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 la demande qu'on a fait, on ne la fait pas de façon partisane. Si on demande à ce que le projet du tramway de Gatineau débloque, c'est parce qu'on pense que c'est un projet qui est bon pour le Québec, c'est un projet qui est consensuel, puis on constate que le projet dort depuis une éternité sur le bureau de Dominique Leblanc. Alors, c'est pas normal, il est temps que ça bouge. Et puis, euh, comme vous l'avez mentionné, euh, c'est pas parce qu'on pense que demain matin, on va nécessairement remporter la circonscription, c'est parce qu'on pense que c'est un bon projet pour le Québec. On pense que même le gouvernement fédéral lui-même en bénéficierait avec le nombre de fonctionnaires qui viennent travailler à Ottawa et le nombre de fonctionnaires d'Ottawa aussi qui vont du côté euh, de, de, de Gatineau pour profiter aussi de, de, du travail qu'ils ont. Alors, on pense que le ministre doit se réveiller puis arrêter de prendre la région pour acquis, parce que ce qu'on voit en ce moment, c'est que les libéraux, on a l'impression qu'ils ne s'occupent pas de l'Ottawa. What do you think? How's it going to be? Do you think you're going to come out okay with, uh, with everything that's been said by Justice Rilla? Well, as we said at the time, we took a decision that we felt was necessary given the unique and unprecedented situation on the ground, not only here in the nation's capital, but right across the country and different locations where our borders are, lo are, are located. And look, as part of the decision to invoke the Emergencies Act, um, we initiated the public inquiry. Um, I testified along with many other colleagues uh, before Judge Rouleau, and we're very eager to receive the final report, take whatever lessons that we can from it, work with the, the public commission to implement them and strengthen the relationship between Canadians and their institutions so that we can keep everybody safe. Thanks very much. Okay, could I get a French clip? Because the SRC will want it too, sure. so, and TVA, yeah, so. Happy to do it. Uh, the, the Donc, uh, uh, nous avons pris uh, une décision qui était nécessaire dans la vie de le gouvernement. On avait invoqué le droit de mesure d'urgence parce que la situation sur le terrain était sans précédent. Il y a plein de défis euh, qui avaient perturbé des travailleurs, des familles, des, des autres. Et ça, c'est la raison qu'on avait invoqué. C'est une, une décision qui a fonction euh, très bien. C'est bien marché sur le terrain. Elle a arrêté les blocages illégaux. Et une partie de la décision est le, le commencement d'une un, enquête publique qui était gérée par le juge Boulot. Moi et mes collègues, on avait offert plein de témoignages pendant plein des heures. Et maintenant, nous sommes très, très anxieux de recevoir le, le, le rapport final. Et après ça, on va prendre des leçons, implémenter les leçons en collaboration euh, avec le, le, le commission publique euh, pour euh, renforcer le, la confiance de toutes les Canadiens dans nos institutions. Merci. So you're not worried about any, any findings against you? Um, so, you know, you have some experience in law enforcement. And I sit on the special joint committee. There you go. Uh, you know, we're. I don't have any preconceived uh, notions yet. I, I know what I've seen, and that certainly there's no evidence to uh, support 
uh, the government met the threshold to invoke the Emergencies Act? None. And, uh, you know, they call, they call it a broader interpretation. I think, you know, it's just uh, legal legal or broader, you know, broader interpretation that they say they relied upon, but it's, uh, you know, is, is it just made up made up stuff so that they can justify it? I don't, I don't know. So I'm hopeful that uh, the justice will, you know, have some things to ensure that, um, you know, he, he had evidence. In fact, I mean, you guys reported... Uh, and he reported that uh, he's disappointed the government wasn't transparent and didn't share what they what they say they relied upon. So uh, we'll see. Uh, we'll see it tomorrow morning. Hopefully, uh, we'll see it the same time the media sees it and and uh, lock ups at nine. We'll, we'll have table by twelve. Yeah, we'll have uh, well, well lock ups at ten. Oh, ten. Well, yeah, I, I, and we'll we'll have some uh, we'll have some more things to say once we get a chance to see it. Okay, cool. right. Convoy inquiry, Justice Rulo is going to be putting it, releasing his report in the next couple of days because he has to under statute. Uh, as a member for Ottawa Centre, is there anything particular you want to see in this report? Well, uh, we know that uh, last year's occupation was uh, was a very traumatic uh, 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 event for for my community, both in terms of residents and and small businesses who were really suffered. Uh, the invocation of the Emergencies Act from the, my pers community's perspective was extremely important because it really did put an end to that three-week-long uh, occupation. Um, I think it's, it's really important uh, through Justice Rulo's commission to understand what happened and, and how can we prevent uh, from ser uh, similar situations from occurring again in the future. Great. Thank you very much. Thank That's you. It. Let's give you a brief comment and then... Uh, we're just debating right now in the House our opposition to motion, and our motion really comes down to a choice that parliamentarians are going to make. Do they choose to defend public universal health care system, or are they going to support the for-profit U.S.-style health care entering into our country? We, we know where we stand very clearly. We want to defend our health care system. We want to invest in health care workers. We want to respect and retain our current health care workers. That's what we believe we need to do so we can defend what we have and we can expand it and make sure we solve the problem. So far, it seems like the liberals and conservatives are signaling that they uh, don't believe in a universal health care system, but their members have a choice to make, and that vote will happen in two weeks from now, whether they choose to defend what Canadians are so proud of or will they continue to erode it. Uh, donc, uh, je viens de, de débattre notre journée d'opposition uh, une motion pour uh, déclarer clairement où, où uh, nous sommes et où, uh, de, de quel côté uh, nous sommes, uh, nous, uh, notre position. Notre position est claire. On, est, on, on veut défendre notre système de santé public. On est contre les soins de santé uh, à l'américaine. Et uh, donc, les, les, uh, dans les chambres de commun, ils vont avoir un choix. Est-ce qu'ils appuient notre système de santé ou est-ce qu'ils ont... Ils sont pour les soins de santé à l'américaine. Le choix, euh, on va décider dans deux, deux, deux semaines. Mais notre position est claire. With that, I'm ready for any questions you have. Why don't you believe the Prime Minister when he says that he is defending the public health system? Well, what the Prime Minister has said in the past absolutely sounded like he defended the, the public health care system. In 2021, he was very clear. He said, you know, watch out for the conservatives. They're going to privatize and bring in for-profit care. For-profit care is going to hurt people. It's going to be all about the bottom line and not about care of patients. It's going to be, be bad for healthcare system. So he's very clear in 2021. Fast forward to present, and when asked the question about Doug Ford's for-profit schemes, he said it was a good idea. He supported it. He says it's the right thing to do. Uh, so there's been a major flip-flop, and so a major uh, difference in opinion now. And, and we stand very firmly in support of solving the problem in our healthcare system. We need more healthcare workers. He's, he's made it clear that he is for the for-profit schemes. The Commissioner Boulos report into the invocation of the Emergencies Act will come out tomorrow. What do you expect to see? Well, with the, with the report, we don't know exactly what the report's going to have included in it. Of course, that's going to be revealed. Uh, when the report's revealed, the details will come out. But, I, but I, a couple things I want to make clear. One of the things that we said at the moment when we were declaring or invoking the Emergencies Act, and that remains to be the case today, is that the invocation of the Act was, a, uh, was, was proof of multiple failures. The fact that we had to invoke the Emergencies Act shows that all levels of government failed to take what was happening very seriously. What was happening in Ottawa 
We had uh, citizens that were being harassed and intimidated. People were being kept up all night. Families were uh, experiencing massive amounts of exhaust fumes. They were struggling with their kids to go to school. Seniors were impacted. We heard of many stories of workers in local businesses, in shops, uh, in food banks who were being harassed and intimidated. Things were very bad for the people of Ottawa. This was a group of people that were targeting the citizens, targeting the people, and the Prime Minister, the Premier, and the Mayor all ignored this. We were also seeing thousands of workers losing thousands of hours in their shifts because of blockades at the bridges. All of this was very serious. How did it get to that point? What, fail, what failure in policing led to this? Because it's clear that levels of police failed, from the RCMP to the local police here in Ottawa. Multiple levels of failure brought us to this point, and I'm hoping the Commission will highlight what needs to be done to prevent the invocation in the future. Uh, it should never have got to that point. Why did it get to that point, and how can we prevent that? Those are things I'm hoping that the Commission will, will bring to light. Um, donc, avec, euh, on, on ne sait pas les détails de la commission, donc on va voir les détails. Mais ce que je veux voir, c'est c'est comment euh, comment c'est s'est passé qu'on est arrivé au moment qu'on a dû utiliser cette euh, cette acte, euh, cette projet de loi. Parce que le fait qu'on a utilisé euh, les 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 mesures d'urgence, ça représente un échec euh, au, au au plusieurs niveaux. Ça représente un échec au niveau euh, fédéral et provincial et aussi municipal, le fait qu'ils n'ont pas pris au sérieux la situation. Et la situation était grave. Les, les citoyens d'Ottawa étaient intimidés, euh, ils étaient harcelés. C'était vraiment difficile pour les familles, pour les entreprises, c'était difficile pour euh, nos aînés. Donc, c'était une situation tellement difficile aussi pour les travailleurs qui ont perdu des heures de travail à cause des blocages euh, des, des frontières. Donc, euh, aussi, c'était un échec des niveaux des policiers, des, des policiers locaux ici de la GRC. Donc, euh, j'espère que la Commission va montrer comment on est arrivé à, à, à une telle situation et comment on peut éviter d'utiliser les mesures d'urgence dans l'avenir uh, pour prévenir une telle situation. Should the report find that the government did not meet the bar for invoking the Emergencies Act, how will your party take responsibility for supporting it? Well, it was clear that uh, it was needed to, to solve the problem that we were up against, uh, the, the crisis in Ottawa, the, the the blockage of the borders that were causing thousands of workers to lose thousands of hours of work and shifts. So it's clear that, that, that it needed to happen. But, but I welcome the advice of the Commission how to avoid ever using it again, uh, what we can learn from how this got to a point that there are so many levels of failure, what we can do to prevent that from happening, and what steps can be taken in the future so that we, if we're ever faced with something similar, can prevent it from happening or stop it earlier. Uh, because it's clear that this was something very serious that, that no one was responding to and, and action needed to be taken. Thank you. Yes. I would like to ask you about the NDP uh, figures that were released today. They're saying that uh, your own government's numbers on how much money has been spent on the on reserve housing program suggest it's going to take between 50 and 140 years to actually meet the need. What's your reaction to that? Well, I think that's you know a bit of an exaggeration. I will say that since 2016, we've committed four billion dollars to on reserve housing, and we've uh, spent about 1.7 billion dollars. The other is all earmarked and planned for specific projects. There's no question that there needs to be more continued aggressive investment in affordable housing on First Nation, indeed across the country, but certainly on First Nation. Um, the challenge is also working with communities on sequencing in some cases. So, as, as you know, uh, um, communities, I was speaking with Attawapiska today, for example, they are in a housing crunch. They have had a significant investment of uh, several million dollars in housing on the in the community, but they've run out of land. And so they need uh, the addition to reserve to move more quickly. That's work that's happening with the Ontario government. The land is currently owned by the Ontario government. My officials are working with Ontario to try to speed up access to the 
plot of land that they will need for the next subdivision. And so it's a, each community is in a different space in terms of where they're at with their planning and with their particular needs, but um, we continue to push forward on investing in housing and many other civil infrastructure needs in First Nations. The Assembly of First Nations estimates that between $40 billion and $60 billion is actually needed to close the gap. As you just indicated, there's been less than $3 billion allocated since the Liberals took power. So how can you say you're committed to this when you're not even in the same ballpark? Well, I would just point to the, the $4 billion since 2016 and the fact that we are still working to distribute that initial investment of $4 billion. There's still more work to do in terms of accessing financial resources to close the gap, but it's not um, obviously just money. It's also the civil infrastructure that goes into creating sub-developments, the, um, the ongoing pressure on water and all kinds of other kind, uh, uh, civil infrastructure that needs to grow commensurately with the housing. And so Communities are grappling with sequencing, with uh, with the challenges of a burgeoning community, and all of the sort of infrastructure needs that go along with with housing. Um, you know, I, I, there's a very vigorous conversation happening right now about what to do, for example, long term in terms of supporting um, better uh, fire prevention and firefighting uh, uh, capacity and resources in First Nations. All of that work has to happen together. I will say that this government's ambition is to meet the 2030 goal of closing the infrastructure gap, and that is going to require aggressive investments, financial investments, but also uh, aggressive and creative ways to address these, these burgeoning communities and the commensurate need that that places on existing infrastructure, some of it which is uh, decades old. So you're saying you are willing to put more money on the table in coming budgets to ensure you do meet that 2030 uh, that's the work of the Minister of Indigenous Services Canada to project what fiscal needs that the department will have to close that 2030 gap and then to submit those proposals obviously to my colleagues and finance and, and other central agencies. It's really about making sure that uh, we're doing things in a logical way, that we have the money booked, that we, we know we can spend that money and that we can get that money out the door. Each year I go back to the department and I make sure that the department in e every region is um, got a, pl a forward plan to spend the money that's already been allocated. We, what I don't want to see is money that's allocated from finance, that's sitting on the books of Indigenous Service Canada, that's not getting out the door. So it's really a balancing act of making sure that we have enough money and we have a path to having that money uh, over the next number of years to 2030 to get to that, um, that target, but also making sure that we have a plan for how we're going to spend that money efficiently. Okay. Those are all my questions. I'll leave it there. Okay. Thanks very much, Brett. Thank you.